Our final presentation will be by Dr. Uh, Rebecca Lopez Garcia. She's an independent consultant in the areas of food safety, toxicology, regulations, and crisis management. She has worked with the, the US Agency for International Development, the, uh, the United Nations FAO, uh, numerous universities, uh, and companies around the world. Um, she is on the scientific advisory board for several food and beverage companies, and she's been instrumental in the regulatory approval for several food additives and novel ingredients. Hello, I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium for the opportunity to be there with you virtually. Today, I will address the safety of non-sugar sweeteners and some of the differences or some of, or try to answer some of the questions that arise when uh, the safety of non-caloric or low calorie sweeteners is discussed. Of course, I would like to make a disclaimer. Uh, this pre present presentation was prepared by myself uh, in a personal capacity and the opinions expressed in this presentation uh, do not reflect the view of the organization. I do work as a consultant and I, I have worked actively in obtaining regulatory approvals of different ingredients, novel foods, and additives around the world. None of, the, of these organizations had influence on the information presented here. The information presented is based uh, generally on the general principles of the Codex Alimentarius. Today, I will uh, cover uh, the definitions and some of the regulatory definitions for, for low-calorie sweeteners. I would talk uh, about the safety evaluation and how is the uh, acceptable daily intake uh, established. Uh, I will address exposure determination and um, then I, we, will, uh, we will talk about some of the conclusions of these evaluations. It is important to know that according to the Codex Alimentarius, a food additive is a substance that's added intentionally to food only to obtain a technological function. It has to have a purpose within the food system. In the case of sweeteners, the technological purpose is to substitute uh, the, the sweet flavors. So uh, low calorie sweeteners are food additives that are used for the technological purpose of obtaining a sweet flavor. This definition is quite important when discussing public health and safety evaluation of food additives. It is important to understand that in order to be added to food intentionally, food additives should not have or should not present adverse effects uh, throughout the toxicological evaluations and, and the safety profile. But it is also important to understand that food additives are not drugs and are not supposed to, to give a pharmacological effect. So when, when food additives, and in this particular case, sweeteners are discussed, it is quite important to understand that uh, by themselves, sweeteners should not have a positive impact on, uh, on bodily functions or a positive physiological impact. The only impact or the only benefit uh, that derives from, from the use of sweeteners is the substitution of sugar or sweet flavors without the metabolic impact of sugars and without the calories of sugars. So uh, it is important to make sure that when, when, when sweeteners are discussed, they're not discussed within the context of uh, trying to address um, certain physiological conditions or certain diseases such as diabetes or they're not associated with a positive impact on their own on weight loss. Why are these, these uh, sweeteners or these compounds associated with weight loss? Well, ideally, when you substitute sugars in the diet and you remove the calories associated with sugars and you still get the sweet flavor, ideally, you would reduce the, the total caloric intake and that could potentially have a benefit or you would remove or you would reduce the intake of uh, caloric sweeteners or sugars and that can potentially have an impact by the improvement of the diet itself, not by a pharmacological function of these compounds. Although the legal definition of sweeteners varies from country to country, the technological function remains the same. 
Sweeteners, as they are approved as food additives, provide sweet flavor or sweeten. And as I stated before, food additives do not have pharmacological properties. If there's a pharmacological property associated with a compound, then the regulatory authorities around the world wouldn't approve these compounds as food additives. It is also important to understand that, that when a food additive is evaluated, the evaluation process is very conservative. It is very strict because it has to take into account not only exposure, but also the moment or the time of exposure throughout the lifetime. When, when one considers the evaluation or the safety evaluation of a drug, for example, it could potentially be limited to a single exposure or a, 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 a time frame when it is consumed under control con conditions to address a specific physiological condition. In the case of foods, one needs to consider that uh, uh, potentially these foods would be considered uh, con consumed throughout a lifetime by any member of the family with any physiological conditions. So as soon as babies are weaned and they start consuming whatever foods are available for the family, they could potentially be exposed to every compound present in the diet. Therefore, the evaluation or the toxicological evaluation for the safety of food additives has to be extremely conservative and always address the most vulnerable member of the population. In this case, uh, one needs to consider population subgroups that could potentially be ex exposed to larger amounts of uh, these compounds. So rigorous testing is always science-based and it includes toxicological evaluation. It does consider relevant clinical information. Uh, we'll consider exposure evaluation throughout a lifetime and obviously consider children and other vulnerable subgroups of the population. Uh, the vulnerable subgroups of the population are quite important because most of the regulatory decisions will have to be made in order to protect these, these more susceptible groups of population. So the safety evaluation or the toxicological evaluation uh, of food additives does consider these individuals in the population that may have a different condition or that may be exposed to larger amounts of the compound throughout a lifetime. The risk management decisions are also based on local exposure. So uh, that, that is very important to consider uh, and to observe when, when one sees different levels or different applications approved in different countries. It is also interesting to note that the toxicological evaluation of these compounds is done by many agencies. And many of these agencies uh, are fully independent. So when one considers the evaluation of the Joint Expert uh, Committee for Food Additives and Contaminants, or JECFA, or the United States Food and Drug Administration, or the European Food Safety Agency, all of these agencies conduct their own evaluation of the available scientific data and come to the same conclusion. So compounds that are approved by all these or that, that have undergone a scientific evaluation by all of uh, these organizations or by, by the majority of these organizations and uh, these scientific uh, evaluations have recommended uh, doses and applications and limits uh, to approve these, these sweeteners uh, to be used by the food industry. It, it means that there's, there's many, many layers of evaluation and consideration of all the scientific data. All of these evaluations are made on a risk-based uh, approach. Now, it is, it is interesting to consider uh, the, the difference between the toxicological evaluation of the safety and the clinical evaluation. Uh, it is also very important to keep uh, in mind that these are two, two processes that although uh, are interrelated, they operate independently. When, when one grades the, the level of scientific evidence, it is important to, to consider that uh, the toxicological evaluation of these compounds remains in, in its own arena. 
So on the screen you will see I have separated the different types of evaluation and on the top of the screen on this inverted triangle like an hourglass uh, you will see all, all of the processes that take place even before a compound reaches the market. It is also important to consider that at this point uh, the evaluation is done on models, whether uh, in, in silico models, uh, in vitro models and, and the use of cell lines or in animal studies, uh, because at this point the, the, uh, the party that's interested in getting approval has to demonstrate that these compounds are not toxic. Uh, do, will not present any adverse health effects. So at this level, it is, it is not ethical to use human beings or use a clinical study. Uh, the, this, these processes uh, help us understand the safety of the compound. And they go by levels, and I will address uh, some of the different levels that are addressed during this, this evaluation process. So it is important to understand that first you get the, the de development of the technology and uh, with the development of the technology it is also important to consider the purity of, of the sample and the compound to get specifications to understand the stability throughout food processing. And then uh, there's a whole battery of testing that is established by uh, different authorities and uh, follows very specific strict protocols usually in vitro models and animal models at this point because the level of exposure will be much higher than what would eventually end up in the diet. After all of this evaluation and once uh, the safe levels uh, are established, then there is a gray area where actually there's clinical evaluation of the compounds. So to answer very specific clinical questions. And at this point, uh, also the compounds are studied in human beings and the absorption, meta uh, distribution, metabolism, and excretion or ADME is, is studied again, but now in humans. And there's also specific clinical evaluation to determine if there could potentially be any impact at the doses that are considered safe. In the case of sweeteners, it is important at this level to understand that there's evaluation on, on the metabolism of glucose and how would, would the use of these compounds impact the homeostasis of, uh, and the sugar metabolism in the body. Uh, all other clinical considerations may include diabetic patients or uh, impact on, on, on different population groups. At this point in this gray level, then the clinical evidence can be uh, evaluated based on on the degree or the, the quality of the evidence. After a compound is approved, then public health decisions must be made based on clinical considerations. But the clinical considerations have many other factors that could have an impact on the outcome of the evaluation. Uh, so all, some of the other factors that need to be considered when, when uh, the, the exposure is evaluated under clinical conditions is um, uh, the diet and the consumption of different foods, the sleep patterns, the physical activity, lifestyle in general, use of other compounds, use of antibiotics, and many other uh, compounds and many other issues that can potentially impact the outcome of a clinical observation. There, the design of clinical studies to come up with evidence, clinical evidence that can be used to make public health decisions is important and obviously the, the level of uh, evidence is also important. Now, it is, it is extremely important to consider that even when I talk about low calorie sweeteners in general, these compounds are unique. On the screen you, you see different molecules and you can see that molecules are extremely different. Uh, each, each of these molecules will give the technological function of sweetening food, but they don't even taste the same. Uh, so each individual compound is also absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted differently. Therefore, it is important to understand that it is impossible to make a general statement about sweeteners 
the evaluation is always done on a case-by-case -case basis, in this case on a molecule-by-molecule -molecule basis. Uh, so there's, it is important to understand that it is impossible to consider sweeteners as a full general category without understanding each compound individually. Each one of these compounds, as it is distributed and absorbed differently, will, will even have a potential of exposure in different areas of the body. Uh, some will be absorbed and distributed systemically, while others will be fully digested and will not be even absorbed as, as a, a complete molecule, but, for example, aspartame will be absorbed as its individual amino acids. So each compound needs to be evaluated and considered individually. So the evaluation before making a regulatory decision goes through identification of the hazard or three basic processes that go through the identification of the hazard and then characterizing what if, if there's potential risk associated with this hazard and what, what are the levels of exposure uh, that will give us full risk characterization. With the risk characterization, then the regulatory agencies can make decisions on approval, need for more information, or even uh, need for additional information or clinical evaluation. Now, the safety evaluation is a long process and it might take uh, many studies and several years to complete. Uh, and it goes in stages, and I consider it like a hurdle race. Why? Because if at any point during the evaluation adverse effects are detected, there's no sense in continuing the race because it is impossible that this particular compound that gave an adverse effect at early stages would ever be approved as a food additive. So um, it's very it's a very complex process that follows very specifically established international standards that are published by World Health Organization, by uh, the Food and Drug Administration. So even, e even each one of these studies has to meet certain criteria and quality standards to be considered. And the evaluation starts with very simple in vitro genetic evaluation to determine if the compound potential is mutagenic, uh, or if it could cause uh, some damage at the cellular level. And this helps, uh, to, uh, this is uh, an initial filter, a pre-filter, that will show if the compound has potential for approval or not. For example, if a compound uh, has a, an adverse effect or, or a negative result on mutagenicity testing, it would not go through the full safety evaluation because potentially it could be considered carcinogenic. So there's no sense in spending all the time and money evaluating a compound that will never be approved. So very early on in the process, the absorption, distribution, and metabolism, metabolism and excretion study is performed first in, in animal models, and it will help understand what would potentially be the target organisms and the target organs, I mean, and, and if there's, there needs to be very specific evaluation. It will also help determine if there are important metabolites that, that need to be considered and evaluated separately. Uh, so at this point, this study is done at large doses using animal models, and it will help determine uh, the design of the rest of the studies, uh, but it will also show potential for bioaccumulation. And it is very important to understand that this information is critical to uh, determine if a, if a product could potentially be accumulated in the body. A product that has potential for bioaccumulation would not be considered to be approved as a food additive because uh, potentially uh, the concentration in the body would increase uh, throughout time. So when, when there's questions or public health questions about what would happen with long-term exposure, uh, results from these uh, original evaluations are very important because they, they will show that there's no potential for accumulation or accumulative effects in the body. After that, uh, the series of evaluations go through acute toxicity to determine the levels where uh, the, the product 
could potentially be toxic. And at this point, it's also important to understand that very, very large doses of the compound are used. Then short-term uh, evaluations, subchronic toxicity. Finally, uh, chronic toxicity, which is the evaluation throughout a lifetime of the different models. And this will help us determine if a product, if, if a compound is carcinogenic or not. Then the reproduction studies that are done in several species and throughout different generations. And these studies will give us information on what happens when there is exposure uh, prior to pregnancy, during pregnancy, at the neonatal stage, and um, during, during the early stages of development and early childhood. And then after we end up with a safe dose, then uh, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and extrusion studies are repeated. And in some cases, here is where we reach the, the gray area in my previous slide, where additional clinical considerations or an, an additional clinical studies may be performed depending on the profile of the particular compound. In the case of low calorie sweeteners, some of the additional clinical evaluations that could uh, be done are based on the impact of uh, long-term exposure in diabetic patients, uh, the impact on uh, blood glucose metabolism, and that kind of study. So each individual compound will derive in the need to perform additional clinical evaluation even before the compound is uh, released to the market. Uh, usually, the acceptable daily intake is established with the information from the chronic toxicological study. Like I said, usually this study will give the potential for carcinogenicity. If a, a compound has potential to be carcinogenic, then it would never uh, be approved. However, other endpoints may be considered if uh, the most critical endpoint is not carcinogenic. So, once uh, the, the dose where no adverse effect levels is established, then uh, this, this dose, uh, which, which means that no, no, no adverse health effects are observed, is divided by a safety factor. The safety factor is usually 100. Uh, usually 10, uh, 10 factor to be able to extrapolate from the animal models to human uh, beings, and the other 10 to take into account intraspecies differences. So we know that human beings um, may metabolize differently, and the, this additional 10 uh, security factor is, is considered to take into account those metabolic differences between uh, different human beings. So with this safety factor, one establishes the acceptable daily intake, or ADI. So the ADI is defined as the daily intake during an entire lifetime that appears to be without appreciable risk to the health of the consumer. It is always expressed in milligrams per kilogram body weight uh, to take into account all members, uh, of all members of the population, including children. So um, it, it also takes into account subpopulations at, at risk, usually what we call the yuppies, the young, the old, the pregnant, and the immunocompromised, or any subpopulation that may have higher exposure or may be at higher risk. Therefore, the ADI, when it is established, takes into account all members of the population, including children, pregnant women, and other susceptible members of the, of the population. It is also important to consider that the ADI is not a safety threshold. It is, it has, in, in the calculation, it has enough safety factor where uh, when, if, if one day the ADI is exceeded, it would not represent a, a toxicological risk to, to that particular individual. Uh, the ADI, as I stated before, is calculated to establish a wide margin of safety, and that's what is used to determine the regulatory status of the product. Once all of this information is available, then each local agency may uh, ask for additional information. Uh, local regulatory agencies will also take the diet and the exposure of the local population. And after all of this information is integrated, then each regulatory agency will make a decision and ask either for additional information 
or have approval and set limits and specific applications for each compound that is approved. The exposure evaluation takes into account the local dietary patterns to establish a total maximum daily intake. And it is calculated multiplying the per capita average daily intake of the food where this additive will be added times the maximum level of use of the additive. So again, the maximum level, per level uh, of proposed use is usually exaggerated. And uh, usually authorities make very conservative assumptions uh, and consider different sources of information. Some of the information sources that are considered include population methods or uh, population food intake balances, home survey methods that determine uh, the food purchased and the food consumed by a family and does not discriminate between individuals in the family, uh, some individual service or food consumption services, surveys and international databases as well as some other market information that will help us determine the most accurate exposure determination to the individual population in a very specific region or in a country. So the approval of a particular compound is based on the best available scientific information. It will take into account uncertainty and safety factors and each local agency will adapt the limits and the applications based on the local dietary part patterns or lo local exposure. In order to conclude, I'd like to say that uh, the toxicological evaluation and the safety of these compounds is very rigorous and is, is always done through a very science-based, risk-based approach. It is conservative, systematic, and dynamic, and it is done by independent evaluation agencies. It is important to remember that no physiological effects should be attributed to food additives. Food additives, in the case of low calorie sweeteners, are added to food to obtain the technological function of sweet flavor. The use of animal models for evaluation um, is, is important because clinical trials are not ethical until safety is established and a safety, or safety margin of exposure is established. Safety and uncertainty are taken, in, taken into account for lifetime exposure. And the approval of a variety of compounds also helps technological applications because it diversifies the risks uh, and it uh, diminishes the amount of, or the exposure for individual compounds. When one considers clinical evaluation to establish public, uh, public health recommendations, it is important to extrapolate the dosages to the real use. It is also important to consider the biological fate of each sweetener, so the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, and consider the biological plausibility of the effect that may be reported. With that, I thank you for your attention with a phrase from, uh, or a quote from Henry Fielding that says that love and scandal are the best sweeteners of tea. So I invite you to promote healthy diets and lifestyles and use low caloric sweeteners as tools to help, uh, help people transition into healthier diets and lifestyles. Thank you very much for your attention.